Can God use someone like me? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Pursuit, a Cross Point City Church podcast that pursues a deeper dive into the scripture of last week's sermon. I'm Carlos Fernandez, and I'm here with our lead pastor, James Griffin. How's it going? Good, man. It's been a busy Monday, bro. It has. It's been a busy weekend. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do? Uh, well, I went to Ohio. Ohio. Oh, that's so, right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You were on a plane, doing some church planning stuff. Yep. Fun. Yeah, it was that, fun. Yeah, yeah, I learned a lot, man. It was, it was good. It's good. good. Little, Welcome it's back. cool to see God work in different places of the United States, but also the world. And yeah. so that could be a great lead into just us talking about what happened in the yeah, beginning of the yeah. sermon yeah. Um, or, or the gathering. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the the pastor we highlighted, right? Yeah. yeah, super cool video that we got to share of a pastor that we partner with in West Africa. Mm-hmm. And this is a brother, man, who has basically started a center for persecuted believers. Yeah. So it, it's crazy, man. In this region of the world, you got people coming to faith. Mm. And it's not like here, you know, where yeah. it's like, you know, nah. you come to faith in Jesus and you just kind of go about your life and everybody mm-hmm. gets over it. But, but there, people are coming to faith, and they have family members abandoning them. Mm. They're being driven out of villages. They are, are, they're having businesses shut down. And so this guy, he purchased a property, and he got some funding to build some buildings on the property. He is housing persecuted believers. Mm. And I'm so proud of our church, man. We actually paid for the well on the property that is now providing clean water for these persecuted believers. Mm. So man, it's it's cool. I mean, it's awesome, dude. We got to highlight this yesterday, and and it's all part of what we're doing for our all to him discipleship journey. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the initiatives is our world, and so we really want to be intentional about the work that we are doing across the globe yeah. to meet physical needs and most importantly to meet spiritual needs. But we do believe that it's a lot easier for someone to hear the gospel if they're not thirsty, yeah. And it's a lot easier for someone to hear the gospel if they're not starving to death, you know. Yeah, and for so. Sure. And so getting clean water to people matters. And and again, I'm just so proud of our church. I, I would just remind people of a couple of things, you know. Number one, when you give here to the mission of Cross Point, no matter who you are, where you're listening from, what location you attend, where you watch from online, when you give here, you're a part of stuff like that. Yeah. And I pray you take joy in that and knowing mm-hmm. that because of the money that you gave online, because of the check you wrote, there are brothers and sisters in Christ all the way across mm-hmm. the world who are getting clean water, you're gonna meet these people in eternity one day. It's crazy to think about that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, But then I would would also say, if you attend Cross Point City Church, every time you buy a cup of coffee from our coffee bar- I was gonna about to say that, yeah. At any of our locations, this is what it goes to. Yeah, that's cool. That all the proceeds, it's not like we just have a coffee bar because we wanna serve coffee, okay? Uh, But all the proceeds and all the profits from our coffee bar they, it, it funds mission work across the globe mm. and specifically the drilling of clean water wells. Yeah. And I can't remember off the top of my head how many we've done over the years. It's been a lot. But I would just say that's that's another reason. Don't bring coffee from home. Buy it from us. Yeah. And just know you're a part of the mission, right? Yeah, it's great. so don't go to Dunkin' or Starbucks. That's, that's what okay. I'm hearing. What are they doing with your money, man? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> um, so if we see you with a Starbucks cup, I'm just playing. <laughs> no, uh, but, uh, but no, that's awesome, man. The fact that we are impacting our world. That's you right. know? I love the three buckets of all to him. So our church, our city, our world, That's right. you know, and That's just right. the way that we're actually using. So if you do give to the mission of Crosspoint, I mean, you're yeah. funding the mission. Yeah. And so don't ever forget that. That's you're exactly just not right. just giving to a church, I man. You're funding the mission of God. That's right. You know? Well, um, I think there's something to what you said too, man, just to, just to be aware mm-hmm. that the whole world belongs to God and that he is at work everywhere. Yeah. I think at times it's so easy just to live in our small little corner of the world and we see God at work here and praise God for what he's doing here, but we lose sight that God is at work everywhere. Yeah. So stories like the one that we shared yesterday just remind us he is at work everywhere. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are experiencing things all over the world that are completely foreign to us. We have no concept of. And so the fact that that God would be so kind as to let us be a part of what he's doing in a place like that, mm-hmm. to touch the lives of people who are suffering for the sake of Christ in ways that we will probably never suffer yeah. here during our lifetimes, I just find it incredible. Oh, absolutely. And I love the fact that we highlight it, Yeah, you know, that we're talking about it. We're spending time, you know, good airtime too, you yeah. know, we're yeah. not just 
posting it something on social media. We we're talking about it at the beginning of the gathering because we want everybody to know what God is doing. That's right. So yeah. I love that, man. But let's talk about the sermon because it right. was really good. And appreciate so, you, bro. Honored I, as I, always. Yeah, I mean, good job. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it was it it was okay, Be- better than the guy from last week. Kind ah. of. I thought I thought the guy from last week was pretty good, yeah. but I'm biased. Close second, right? <laughs> yeah, close second. <laughs> Um, but man, I there I don't think we need to do a recap. Okay. Because I, I want to hit some things that you pretty much said in the sermon. Yeah. And so you talked about kindness really early on. Yeah. Um, yeah so yeah. I just want you to kind of let let let's just chat about yeah. that real quick. Well, I'll tell you, man, as I was as I was going through the text, you know, mm-hmm. as I sermon prep, and you know this because yeah. we've talked a lot about this. Step number one of sermon prep for me is I print out the passage that I'm gonna preach, Mm. and then I spend at least a couple of hours in observation mode, all Mm -hmm. right? I don't touch a commentary, I don't read books, I don't go hunt down what other people have said. I just print the text out, I pray, and I ask the Spirit of God to open my eyes to see what I need to see in the scriptures, Mm -hmm. and then I just work through it, all right? And I diagram, and I write down questions, and jot down other passages that come to mind. Well, gosh, when I was working through this text, the kindness of Jesus just Mm. leapt off the page at me. Yeah, And I'm reading and rereading, and I just started to see his kindness everywhere in his pursuit of of the disciples after the resurrection as they're going back fishing, you know? Mm. And the fact that he told them to cast the net on the other side of the boat and provided this massive haul of fish, and the fact that he built a charcoal fire where he would restore Peter and, and... I mean, you see it all over the passage that he would serve them by cooking breakfast for them after a bad night of fishing. Yeah. And so, man, as I prayed through it, and then I started working through commentaries and started reading what other people had read, uh, I just felt like that's the angle that we got to preach this thing from. And and I really wanted to hold up the kindness of Jesus mm. as not only something to be seen, but as something to be emulated. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I said it very early on that that when we live our lives as kind people in God's world, it is attractive. Oh, absolutely. It's attra- And it draws people in just like the kindness of God is what draws people to repentance. That's mm-hmm. Romans 2, 4. It is our kindness toward people, I believe, that draw people toward God, mm-hmm. which then leads to repentance mm-hmm. prayerfully, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And so that was the goal, to show people the kindness of Christ from the passage and to challenge people to be those people for the sake of others. Yeah, no, I love that. I was thinking when you you were preaching, that's one of the reasons why, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, why Constantine made Mm. Christianity, uh, (laughs) right? He started recognizing some stuff was different. Yeah, they started writing about it, and it's because they were taking orphans and taking in widows and Mm. just doing, I mean, like they were just doing things. Faithful in marriage. Yeah. I mean, all kinds of caring for the poor. Yeah, but kindness is what made them, you know. So I I love the fact that we just talk about that. And you did kind of say that being nice and being kind, they're two different things. Yeah, they're not yeah, yeah. the same thing. And right. a lot of people get that mixed up. Like yeah. if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be nice. No, no, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be kind. <laughs> that's right. So Yeah, no, that's, you, you know, I mean, you're hitting the nail right on the head. As as followers of Jesus, we should be the kindest people on the planet. Mm. Because again, at the end of the day, we are striving to be more like Jesus, who's a kind savior. The spirit of God, if we know him, lives in us. And he is always working to produce fruit in our lives, Part of that fruit, according to the Apostle Paul, is kindness, mm. that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And then ultimately, we belong to a kind Father, mm. and we see His kindness in the gospel, what He's done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. I mean, pursued us, chased us down, saved us when we were His enemies, brought us into His family, made us love sons and daughters. We did nothing to earn it. Mm-mm. We have done nothing to deserve it. Yet God in grace and kindness did that for us. Yeah. And so, as I said in the sermon, the expectation now is that as people who belong to him, we would extend the same kindness we've received to other people. Mm-hmm. But to your point, that's more than us being nice, all right? Yeah. Something that I didn't say over the weekend that I'll say on the podcast, I think at times kindness can be upsetting. Yeah. Okay. And so don't think about, oh, being kind means that I don't upset people. Sometimes being kind means that you have to upset people. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, Carlos, that clarity is kindness. Have you ever heard this? Oh, yeah, it's a big leadership thing. Right. Like if you're a leader, you want to be clear. That's exactly right. And so 
you know, the idea is what you said. To be kind, I have to be clear. Mm -hmm. I can't make, you know, unclear statements. I, there can't be any ambiguity. Ambiguity. People don't need to guess where I stand or where I don't stand. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to be kind, I need to be clear. And being clear means that I have to tell the truth. Mm. And sadly, not everyone wants to hear the truth. And, yeah. so, and sometimes, man, you can be as loving and as kind as humanly possible in telling the truth, mm -hmm. and people who hate the truth still don't want the truth, right? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes being kind, it's upsetting. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about how to illustrate this. Uh, over the weekend, my wife and I went to a wedding, mm -hmm. and my wife bought two different dresses because she couldn't decide <laughs> which one <laughs> she wanted to wear to the yeah. wedding. <laughs> so she buys two different dress dresses, and she brings them home, and she's trying them on and she's showing them to me. And her question was, which one looks best? <laughs> and so I, I just told her, I'm like, that one, you know, yeah. the first one you put on. And she said, are you telling me the truth? And I said, I'm absolutely telling you the truth. The first one looks better. The second one's not very flattering. I wouldn't lie to you. And so in telling my wife the truth, I'm being unkind, or I'm being kind, excuse me, you yeah. know? The unkind thing to do would be, hey, babe, which, whichever one. Yeah. Wear whatever one you want. Mm hmm. But the truth is, it was a dress that looked better on my wife, and so I told her. Yeah. And again, clarity is kindness. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, my wife wanted the truth, and so she took it in stride, and she picked the dress I picked, and <laughs> she looked my dog. <laughs> she looked absolutely gorgeous, Good man. Job, and so, man. but uh, but we just have to remember that. Yeah, it's it's bigger than you just not trying to upset people. The way yeah. that I said it in in the sermon, the definition that I gave is that kindness is a supernatural selflessness toward others even when you get nothing in return. Mm. A supernatural selflessness. So in other words, you can't produce it on your own. Mm -hmm. It is not a natural selflessness, it's supernatural. This is something that God has to do in you. Mm -hmm. Selflessness, this is about you having the mind of Christ, Philippians 2 kind of stuff, mm -hmm. that you are prioritizing over others over yourself. You're not just thinking about your interests but the interests of other people. In humility, you're counting every other person in your life as more significant than you. Mm -hmm. And so it is a supernatural selflessness, even when you don't get anything in return. And so you're not like going at it with some agenda in mind. Okay, mm -hmm. I will be kind so that this person will do X for me. Mm -hmm. I will be kind in hopes that I benefit in some way. <laughs> yeah. But you're showing up and displaying that type of selflessness with no expectation on the other person. And so the other way that I said it is that we are treating people in the same way Christ treated us. Mm -hmm. And this also applies to our enemies, man, mm. which is where it gets really, really hard. Oh, yeah. And again, we just got to go back to the gospel. When we were enemies of God, this is when he displayed kindness. Yeah, we were far for him. For right? Him. Yeah. When, when we were at our worst, this is when God gave his best. Mm. And so part of treating people like we've been treated is that we would be supernaturally selfless toward them even when they're at their worst. Yeah, no, that's so and, good. Right? Yeah, when you remember what Jesus has done, yeah. it makes you do things in the world, that's right? right? And so being, you know, the fact that God was kind to us, like you said, the lowest point of our lives, yeah. right? When we yep. were dead in sin. Yep. And that's why we should be kind. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the reasoning behind why we should love our enemies and love the people who persecute us, you that's know, right. and pray for those that, that we don't like, all those things. That's exactly so, right. I love that. It is it is just yet another response to the gospel. Mm, that's good. Right? Yet another like response. Our kindness toward people is yet another response to the gospel. It is an act of worship mm -hmm. in which we are imitating God, bearing his image rightly in the world. Yeah. I would say all in hopes that people who are far from him would see his character in us and come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. So there's a lot at stake here. That's why, again, I go, it's more than you just being nice, you know? Yeah. Like kindness is a missional move on part on the part of the church. Oh, yeah. When, when we move into the world and we do for people what Christ has first done for us, mm. we do it in hopes that people are going to be drawn in. Oh, yeah. That they're going to lean in and, and they're going to see the gospel in the way that we love them, mm -hmm. share truth with them. And so, you know, one of the things that, that uh, is here on the notes is like, what does it mean to be marked by kindness? I just I just pulled a passage that I didn't have time to get to in the sermon mm -hmm. that I thought we could just talk about for yeah, a minute. Let's do it. And and feel free to chime in here, all right? Yeah, I'm down. But this is what Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. He says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Mm -hmm. And then he says, Be kind to one another. There's our word, 
tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Mm. And so as I think about the practicalities of this, what I see Paul saying here is step number one in being kind is we got to put some things away. Yeah. We can't be bitter people. We can't be angry people. We can't be slanderous people. We can't be those people attacking and stabbing folks in the back and talking behind their back and holding grudges and, right? Yeah. So again, when we talk about supernatural stuff, that's supernatural stuff. Mm -hmm. We can't put those things away unless God does a work in our hearts and in our lives. And so I would say that's the, that's the negative part. Like, don't do these things, put these things away. And then we practice kindness, which the expression of that, uh, according to Paul, is, is a tenderheartedness. I think about mm -hmm. compassion is another word. That, that we would enter into pain with people, enter into suffering with people, that we would show mercy to people. Mm -hmm. And it also looks like forgiveness. Man, the people who've wronged us or hurt us or whatever that might be, that we would extend the same forgiveness we've received from Jesus. And so there's all these nuances to kindness that have to be considered. Oh, yeah. It's more than being nice. Yeah. It is you acting like Jesus toward another person with no expectation on that person. Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah, I actually put down that, yeah, as I was like doing some research early, just talking about like comparing nice and kindness. Mm. Um, it says, being nice typically involves pleasing others, conforming <laughs> to social norms and yeah. acting in a pleasant or agreeable manner to be liked. There you right? go, man. There's they the got an agenda. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But then kindness, on the other hand, kindness is char characterized by selflessness, genuine care for others, and acting in the best in interest of others out of love, empathy, and that word to use, compassion. There it is, yep. I love this. Kindness goes beyond mere politeness. Mm. You're not just being polite. That's right. You know, it's, it's going beyond that. It involves showcasing or showing consideration, generosity, and helpfulness towards others without expecting anything in return. And I That's love it. that kindness is rooted in strength, compassion, and a desire, man, a desire to help yeah. those that are suffering. That's so good, you man. Know? Yeah, so. which again is what Christ did for us. Mm -hmm. I'll say one other thing, man, and and we can talk more about this or keep rolling. What I found, what I find to be so interesting about that Ephesians four passage, and mm -hmm. and if you're listening and uh, you want to go back and read the whole thing, I would highly advise that. There's so much in there, mm -hmm. but right before Paul talks about putting away bitterness and wrath and anger and being kind, he says, "Do not grieve the Holy Spirit." Mm. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And I know people like to cherry pick the Bible at times and they'll rip verses like that out of context and just talk about ways that we grieve the Holy Spirit. And I think there are a lot of ways that we do oh, it. Yeah. But what we can't miss is the context here that Paul buries that statement in the middle of a passage where he is talking about our relationships with other people. Mm. And and the way primarily according to the context of the text that or the context of the passage that we grieve the Holy Spirit of God is that we fail in this, mm. that we tear people down and we don't build people up, that we hold grudges and we don't forgive, that we're not kind, that we're, that we're unkind. And when we treat people in a way that would contradict the way Christ treated us, mm. that grieves the Holy Spirit. Mm. It causes the Spirit of God pain emotional distress mm. when we fail to live this out in the world, yeah. which is a very weighty thing. Yeah. No, that's good, man. So what I'm hearing is you can't gossip and be kind at the same time. No. You can't impossible. hold bitterness and be kind at the same time. So right. if you got stuff stored up, man, you got to figure that out. You actually have to trade that in for kindness, Yeah. right? Yep. You have to trade in your bitterness to go forgive somebody. You got to yeah. let go and let God handle all those things. So yeah. no, that's really yeah. good. I love that. And you grieve the Holy Spirit. When you don't do those things, that when Jesus, yep. that uh, prayer that Jesus had in John 17, that we would be one, yep, yep, you know? That's right. That when that doesn't happen, when there's division in the house, it grieves mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. That's you right. Know? It hurts us. Well, because at that point, what you're doing is resisting him. Yeah. Because his goal is to produce all of this in the life of the believer. Yeah, that's good. But the believer that is practicing the opposite of these things is resisting the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And to resist the work of the Holy Spirit is to grieve the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. And so you're, you're pushing back on what he's wanting to do in your life and through your life. 
So there's a lot at stake here. All and, right. So, and, yeah, go ahead. So I got a question then. Okay. So the person that does have that, has that bitterness, that unforgiving heart, you mm-hmm. know, like what do they do right now? They <laughs> want to be kind, but yep. man, they're struggling. It yep. is so hard. Like yeah. how would you encourage them? Yeah, I think that's a great question, man. Uh, you know, I talked a lot in the sermon over the weekend just about the importance of confessing our need to God. Mm, that's good. And, and not being those people that just try to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps who think we're just going to like work on this and get it right on our own. Mm. And that was the problem with the disciples in the text is that they went to work and produced no results. Mm. And I think the temptation for the person who knows they're unkind but wants to do better is, well, I'll just do better on my own. Mm. And, you know, and you like you feel bad about being a jerk and then you're like, well, I got to fix it. And you start trying to fix it and you only make so much progress because you're trying to do it in your own strength, okay? Yeah. So I, I would say a couple of things. Number one, you have, to, you have to be aware that only the Spirit of God can produce this in your life. Mm. You can't do it. He has to do it. And the step number two is that you humbly and readily acknowledge that to him. Mm, that's good. Holy Spirit, I, I want to be like this, and I'm not like this, and I know I can't make myself like this on my own, so will you do it in me? Mm-hmm. And when you bring your need humbly before the Lord and you ask for his help, I believe he's going to help you. Oh, absolutely. Right? He's going mean, to show up. I mean, bro, you're about to be a dad. Mm-hmm. I can tell you this from experience being a dad. Anytime my daughters humbly come to me and say, Daddy, help. Mm-hmm. I need help. I, need, I can't do it. I need help. Oh, man, I jump in joyfully, oh, yeah. and I want to help my daughters. Well, as the people of God, when we go to God— God our Father, God the Holy Spirit, Jesus our King and Savior, and we're like, I need help. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. I need help. Do you know that God joyfully runs in our direction? Oh, absolutely. And so you just got to trust to know that the Spirit of God is going to meet you in your weakness, Mm -hmm. and he's going to do in your life what you cannot do on your own, Mm -hmm. and that he will produce it in you. And and then all of a sudden you're gonna notice some change happening there, and you get to take no credit for it. Mm, that is <laughs> you just good. gotta point all the honor and the glory back to him because you know he did it. Yeah. No, I love it, man. Well, that we can actually talk about the next thing then. Okay. All right. Because you're pretty much saying, hey, if you don't think that you can be used, mm. then ask God and he can use you That's because right. he's gonna transform you. And I love the fact that I, I learned early on as a Christian that it is not me who is producing the fruit, but it is Christ in me. That's that right. as I mature, I'm becoming more like Jesus. And that right. when I become more like Jesus, then it's easier to be kind to people. 100%. And so let's talk about that person who just, I don't think God can use me. I don't yeah. feel like they, <laughs> like I have anything to give them. And I, you spoke about it in the sermon. So, I did, yeah. yeah. Well, the first thing that I would say to someone who believes this is that you are believing a lie from the enemy. Mm. If you are someone who looks at yourself, maybe past failures, past mistakes, issues that you have going on in the background of your life, whatever it may be, and you're like, God can't use someone like me, I would just tell you, out of love for you, you are believing a lie from the pits of hell itself, okay? Mm -hmm. The reality is when God saves a person and he brings them into his family and makes them a son or a daughter, he then sends that person into the world on mission, okay? Mm -hmm. And so this is John 20, 21. You preached on this a couple Mm -hmm. weeks ago, right? Where Jesus stands before his disciples behind a locked door. They're all afraid. And he's like, hey, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you, you, okay? As as followers of Jesus, we are in the world as a sent people. Mm -hmm. And we have been sent to do the work of the Great Commission, to make disciples of all people groups, to help people understand and know what it means to follow Christ, That's a mission given to the church. And so if you know Christ, you're a part of that. God wants to use you to accomplish that. Mm. What the enemy wants to do is convince you that you can't be a part of that. Mm. He wants to sideline you, right? Uh, He doesn't want you to contribute. He just wants you to consume. He doesn't want you to participate. He wants you to spectate. Mm. And so what he will do is he'll bring up all this stuff in your life, and he'll just throw it at you, and he'll lie to you and he'll accuse you and he'll try to tempt you and and his whole goal is to convince you of what we're talking about God can't use a person like you yeah 
Do you see the affair? Do you see the divorce? Do you see the addiction? Look at the porn thing. Like, and he'll just kind of run through the, and then he'll lie to you about you and he'll lie to you about the character of God and, mm. and God's willingness to use you and he'll put shame on you and shame is what sends people into hiding and as long as you're hiding and not being truthful and not being honest, yeah, you're gonna stay on the sidelines. Yeah. And so again, I just wanna say, if that's what you are believing, you are believing a lie from the enemy. The condemnation that you are living under is not from God. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Paul says. Mm. And so at some point, you got to come out from under that. You got to stop living under those lies and under that shame. And you've got to believe what God says is, is true about you and what's possible for you. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. You're yeah. believing a lie. Number two, I would say you got to read your Bible. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I was literally just <laughs> about to say that. Uh, Man. All right, well, all right, well, let's talk about that then. That's like the best thing you could do because if you read it, there's yeah. no way that you can come to that conclusion. Bro, 100%. <laughs> like, okay. I I'll, literally was about to stop you and just say, hey, that's what you need to do, but I didn't read it. That's so good. No, it's all good, dude. Well, I, I made a list yeah. of, of people, and there's way more. I mean, I just jotted down five names oh, yeah. really quickly off the top of my head. But what I love about the Bible, Carlos, is that when you read it, you learn very, very quickly that God doesn't go after the best and the brightest. Mm -mm. He often goes after the worst, and he goes after the people that don't really have a whole lot to offer. Yeah. And I think the reason God does that is so that in the end, he gets all the honor and all the glory. Mm. That the people that God chooses to use can take no credit for what he does in and through their yeah, lives. But at the end of the day, all these folks and all the people who know these folks have to take a step back and go, only God could have done that. Mm -hmm. Only God could have done that through that person's life. Oh, yeah. And so I <laughs> think about Ab Abraham was a liar. Yep. Okay. Lied twice about mm -hmm. who his wife was. Yeah, because he was scared. To save his own butt, mm -hmm. right? And and he was a liar, and he's the father of our Christian <laughs> faith. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, Moses was a murderer. Mm -hmm. You know, killed a dude, went into hiding for a lot of years, and then... God used him as the prophet and deliverer for the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. David, King David, was an adulterer and a murderer. Yep. I mean, this is a man described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. Mm. This was a man that God made a covenant with to bring an eternal king into the world who would establish an eternal kingdom for his people. Yeah. I mean, we still talk about today Jesus sitting on the throne of David. Mm. Yet David was a man who committed adultery with a woman who was married to a soldier in his army and then manipulated the system and brought the soldier, soldier home and had him married to cover up a pregnancy that he, he was ultimately responsible for. Insane. Mm. Uh, Peter, the guy we talked about, denier, three times before the arrest of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus. Den I don't even know him. Yeah. And then I thought about Paul. I mean, my gosh, this guy's a religious terrorist. Yeah. The way that I have described Paul, he was like the Osama bin Laden of our day. Yeah. He was out hunting down Christians and murdering them. And then God turned him into one of the greatest missionaries and church planters the world has ever seen. And so again, I would just say, if you're like, oh, God can't use me, you're believing lies and you need to read your Bible, you are in the perfect position to be used by God if you feel like you have nothing to offer because God is a God who opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Yeah. And as long as you stay in that lowly, humble spot and you put your life in the hands of God, He'll take you and use you in ways that you can't ask or imagine. Mm. So anyway, no, did, that's you, so good. did you have other thoughts running through your mind I, when you were I thinking did. like Bible, read the Bible? Yeah, I mean, I, I have some, but I want to say something about Paul. I'm reading right now on the evidence of the resurrection. It's just a book okay. talking about all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that Paul, okay, was the one who wrote most of the New Testament. Yeah. Okay. And they, he, Jesus used him chose him yep. all right and so if you're saying that you can't be used and they're using a guy who killed christians that's right he they were actually so scared of him they thought that it was a hoax when he became a christian exactly because they thought that he was just doing this to kill them yeah. right and yep, so yep. he had to go into not hiding but he went to go learn and make right. sure for i mean almost yeah, more than a, a decade while. right that's right yep yep and so i just thought of paul just like man what a story that's right. That God used Paul in such a mighty way that we yeah. read about him today. Yeah. You know? Well, and, I, and I love what you said, too, about the resurrection. I know we're stepping on Easter, but mm. one of the greatest evidences of the resurrection is that. Yes, yeah, Paul. Is that on, on the other side of the resurrection of Christ, that some of his fiercest enemies mm -hmm. became his greatest advocates. Yeah. And there's no other explanation for that. Yeah. How, how does a guy go from 
murdering Christians and truly believing with all of his heart he was doing the right thing mm -hmm. for the glory of God yeah. and the good of, of the Jewish nation. How does a guy go from that to being imprisoned and ultimately being executed mm -hmm. for preaching a resurrected Jesus yeah. and faithfulness to him? It's because he saw him. It's exactly what it's happened. He, he had an experience with that yeah. Jesus. Mm. Knocked, so him, good. knocked him to the ground, blinded him. <laughs> We're not doing this anymore. Yeah. I love that. So yeah, great so story. Good. But no, I would literally say the same thing. Have you read your Bible? And the ones I was thinking about was, I mean, obviously you talked about Paul, but just the woman at the well, John 4, mm. right? Mm -hmm. That Jesus met her at that spot and she was living in sin. Right? right, so you would you would this is a girl that you don't want to be with, you don't want to <laughs> hang out with. This is that type of yeah, woman, yeah. and I just remember her going back to her village and yeah. saying, "Hey, come meet the guy that told me everything I've ever done." Yeah, and it said that the like her whole village came to faith in Jesus because yeah. of what she's done. That's right, you know. And so if you believe that hey, God can't use you, then you're wrong. It yeah. is a lie from the enemy. Yeah. But I love um, the fact that Jesus is trying to use you in such a mighty way that you could be the reason why people mm -hmm. are in heaven. That's like, right. You know, obviously Jesus died for him, but you'll be right, the, right, the right, person right. who He's introduces gonna, he wants to use you. Yeah. You know, to, yeah. to man, I just love that. And yeah. that picture when you get to heaven, that uh, just like we said earlier, like. We're going to meet people, yeah. and they're going to say, thank you for sharing the gospel with me. Yep, yep. Thank you for for being kind and, and letting me know that what Jesus has done. Yeah. And he can use you. Yeah. He can use yeah. you, regardless of what you've done. Yeah. And so, well, let's talk about this for just a minute before we keep going. Yeah. Because this is coming to mind, and I think this matters, okay? Mm -hmm. I think it's easy for people to listen to a podcast like this or to go mm -hmm. listen to a sermon on a Thursday or a Sunday and uh, to hear guys like us talk about this and to go, oh, of course you guys would say it. Yeah. Oh, you're pastors and you work on staff at a church and blah, 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 you know. So let, why don't we just talk about us for a minute? Yeah, let's do it. I was I, just about to say I, that. <laughs> bro, I mean, I'm sitting behind this microphone mm -hmm. as a guy who has a dad who was a first-generation Christian, and I come from a long line, like on the Griffin side of the family, mm -hmm. it ain't a bunch of like faithful Christ followers. And it's not a bunch of pastors. Like, I, I come from North Georgia mountain moonshiners. Mm -hmm. I come from people who are caught up in alcoholism, drug use, people who are having affairs, people who are committing adultery. I mean, dude, this is my family, a, a legal activity. Like, these are, this is the family I come from, right? Mm -hmm. And then in his 20s, uh, my dad, came to faith in Jesus Christ. God radically saved him, changed his life. And here we are a generation removed from that. And you got a dude sitting behind a microphone talking about, oh, you can be used by God. Oh yeah. And so it, it applies to even my own life. Like, as I look back, dude, I'm a Paulding County, Georgia boy, you know? I mean, dude, I'm from the middle of no, like there's no <laughs> reason that I should be sitting behind this microphone right now saying stuff like this other than the fact that my life is a testament to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to say again, doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter family history, how you grew up, if anybody else in your family knows Jesus, like things you've done, whatever, man, if you will humbly put your life into the hands of, of almighty God and trust him with your life, he can use you in ways you can't ask or imagine. I promise you. That's so good. That's why leaders need to be transparent. That's right. You know, that they weren't always perfect and that, yeah. that God had to rescue them out of sin too. That's right. You know, I think a lot of people, they put pastors on pedestals yeah. and yep. they put them on these places that's like unachievable. And yep. to tell you the truth, that's one, just kick, kick that out of your mind right now. Don't mm -hmm. do that. Yep. But then two, pastors and leaders, you got to be transparent that right. you weren't always where you are today, 100%. you know? And so, yeah, I haven't always been in this spot. And I remember in high school, dude, I... I didn't have a future. Yeah. I remember one of my best friends telling me at the time, we were just sitting down joking at one of our friend's house. Yo, Carlos, he's not going to college. He's not doing anything with his life. He's yeah, not. Yeah. And I remember, like, I can vividly Still tell sticks you, with you when I heard that. Mm. And so now to, to be used by God. And when you look back, all you can say is God got a hold of my life. That's right. God moved in such yep. a way that man just made a difference. Mm. And now... I can tell somebody who comes from a single parent household yep. who is, you know, I mean, opportunity just didn't come my way. Right, right. I, when I moved here, look, I, I didn't have 
the things that people have today, like I didn't have when I was young. Like I, I just think about all the things. I mean, we never even had cable. You know, like it was. <laughs> we didn't either, bro. You know, it was just crazy. <laughs> yeah, I remember yeah. moving from apartment to apartment when I was young yeah. in New Jersey. Like we moved from Jersey to Georgia for my mom to afford a house. Right, right. And then I met Jesus and it just, everything changed. Like yeah. he gave me hope. He yeah. gave me a future. And I think that everyone needs to hear that, dude, like wherever you're at, God can use you and he's going to use your story to reach people just like That's you. That's exactly right. That's right. So yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, you can be used and and don't believe that stinking lie that the stupid enemy of the, <laughs> tells you. Like, like stop listening to the world, the flesh and the devil because they're exactly trying to right. deceive you. Right. He's doing the same thing he did in the garden, right? Yep. So That's don't listen exactly to right. the stinking lies. God can use you, and He's gonna. You're gonna be so surprised. Mm-hmm. When I when I preached the other day, I, the, before I left my house, I was at my bedside, and I was just like, God, how'd I get here? Yeah, man. How'd I get here? It was you. Yep, yep, yep. yep. It was you, and I just sitting there, just yep. thank you. I had a moment like that on Sunday, bro. Mm. Standing in the gathering, just at the end of the gathering, I'm standing kind of over in the wings. We're waiting mm-hmm. to baptize a guy. And I'm looking at this room that's just packed full mm. of people. We're singing in Christ alone. I mean, hands raised. And I'm like, how, how in the world did I get here? Mm. And God, why in the world would you let a dude like me do this? And again, it's the kindness of God mm. yeah. <laughs> that, that he would invite people like us into his work and that he would use us despite us. Yeah. And that's the invitation to every person who's listening to this podcast today. God wants to do the same for you. His heart is to do the same for you. Mm-hmm. You got to trust him and you got to believe him over the enemy. Yeah. Read your Bible. Be used by God. Yeah. He could do it, man. Yep. No, that's awesome, man. So then this is actually a good segue. Okay. Because you said this and this was bombs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was sitting there. I was like, man, this is pretty good. So. <laughs> There's a lot of people who feel like they can't be used by God because they feel like they're a complete failure. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And you said this line that failure isn't final. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. And I know that it resonated with people because people are holding on to their failure. Oh, yeah. Man, like it's a pet. Yep. Yep. So let's talk about that a little bit. All right. Yeah, you know, I talked about this within the context of of the disciples fishing all night Mm. and catching nothing. Mm. And then Jesus shows up on the shore the very next morning, daybreak, and he's like, hey, cast your net on the other side of the boat. And what's interesting, they didn't have to. Mm -hmm. They didn't even know it was Jesus at that point. You know, they could have been like, no use, whatever, stranger on the shore, we're professionals, we don't have to listen to you. They could have just packed it up and gone home, right? We're a bunch of failures. But they decided to listen, Mm -hmm. and they did what Jesus told them to do, and they cast their net on the other side of the boat, And they brought up this massive haul of fish, so many fish, they couldn't get it into the boat. Mm -hmm. And so I I just made the point there that the difference between their failure and success was obedience. Mm -hmm. The difference between their failure and their success was obedience. And how this is always true in the life of the believer, you know? It's like we can put in all the work we want to try to change our lives or fix our situations, but as long as we're doing it our way, it's going to be a train wreck. I mean, mm. we're going to we're going to fail, we're going to be frustrated. But in the moment we just do what Jesus tells us to do, that is when things change. And so it all goes back to the Christian worldview. I thought I'd speak to this again really quickly mm. uh, because it matters so much how we see the world as people. Yeah. And as Christians, we see the world very differently than no, yeah. than other people, especially where we live in our society today, you know. Mm-hmm. The Christian worldview is very simplistic. Mm-hmm. that we believe in one God who has created all things and who designed all of life to work in a very specific way and that when we do life God's way, that is when life works. Mm. So when we live according to God's design, we flourish, mm-hmm. we succeed. It's when we experiencing experience the blessing of God upon our lives, okay, uh, where that rubs against society and culture. Like we live in a culture that would say, no, it's just a free-for-all. We don't, we don't know if there's a God or not. Mm. And, and even if there is a God, he just kind of set things in motion and he checked out. And so as people, it's up to us to determine our truth. And as people, it's up to us to determine how we want to live our lives. And what we're told constantly is that, to live our, we, that we should live our lives not based off what is true, but off of what we feel. Mm. And as long as you will live your life based on what you feel is right or best for you, you will flourish 
and you will know joy, and you will be satisfied. And my gosh, man, just look at the state of our nation. We know that's a lie. Yeah. It's cr- I mean, I've said it so many times over the last several months. If, if you look at the messaging we are giving people, and then you look at what's happening regarding anxiety, depression, suicide rage, drug use, antidepressants, it's crazy, right? Everything's up and to the right. So clearly, the way that we are teaching people to view the world is not working. Mm-hmm. And so this is very, very applicable here. And I, I would just say to all of our listeners, okay, if you want to know if God's way actually works, then do it his way. Yeah. And, and I promise what you'll find is that as you obey God and do life his way, that's when things start to succeed and that's when things start to change and, and turn around. Mm-hmm. And so I think maybe we're going to talk about some specific categories again. Yeah. You want to do that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. If we want to talk about any more, we can. Um, the three that are here in my notes were marriage, money, and dating. Mm-hmm. And I know we talked about these recently on another podcast, so I'll try to freshen it up a little bit. Maybe we can talk about it in a slightly different way. But, you know, as I was thinking about marriage, again, as Christians, we believe that God instituted marriage Mm -hmm. and that it was his idea that he defined it all the way back in the beginning. And that God according, or I'm sorry, excuse me, marriage according to God in the Garden of Eden is one man, one woman for life. Mm-hmm. So this is what happens, that that a man and a woman leave their mo- mother and father and they cleave to one another. They become one flesh. And so marriage is this covenant between a man and a woman for life before God. And each parties within the marriage has certain roles and responsibilities. Mm-hmm. You know, Carlos, as husbands, we are called to love our wives like Jesus loved his church and gave himself up for her. And within marriage, we're supposed to serve our wives in a way that would lead to her sanctification, right? Yeah. That, that we love her and we lead her and we invest in her, that we help her flourish. Mm-hmm. We help her to grow into the woman that Christ would have her to be. We do that in whatever ways that she needs us to do that. But it also means that we're the men taking the initiative in the relationship, mm-hmm. that we serve first, we go first, we forgive first, like mm. we seek to understand first. This is what we do as men, you know? Yeah. Like we're meant to be leaders within our marriages and being a leader doesn't mean that you're large and in charge and you're the boss and she does what you say. It means that you serve your bride mm-hmm. because Jesus served his bride. This is what headship means. It's not that you're some jerk boss and your wife around. It means that you love your woman in a way that leads to her growing in Christ likeness. And so husbands, I would say, if you're trying to figure out marriage, well, that's where you got to start is by doing your job, doing your role. Okay. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, a wife is called to submit to her husband as the head of the marriage, just as the church submits to Christ. Mm -hmm. And again, submission on the part of the wife is not, well, I stay quiet and I stay in my lane and I just do what he says, okay? Um, Women have gifts and, and sometimes women are great leaders and they have skills that they need to offer in marriage that maybe the man doesn't possess. And, and so the wife is there to help and to work in partnership with the husband but, but the goal of the wife is to follow her husband as the ultimate leader mm-hmm. because the buck stops with him. Yeah. The man answers to God for the condition of the marriage. And so the wife is called to submit to the husband in that way and also to honor and respect him, mm. not to dishonor and disrespect her husband, but to honor and respect him in all things. And so let me say it like this. The reason that a lot of marriages fail and end in division and divorce and husbands and wives who like hate each other's guts is because you have a husband who's not loving his wife like Jesus loved the church, Mm. but he's loving himself and he's proud and selfish and he thinks his wife is there to serve him, not the other way around. That's problematic. And then you have a wife who's trying to usurp the husband's leadership and she's trying to lead and she's trying to be the head of the marriage and Instead of honoring him and respecting him, she's dishonoring and disrespecting and nagging and thinking that if she could just be the one in charge, things would go better. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden they're doing it their way and it's failing and, and they're frustrated and they can't figure out what's going on. That's what goes on in bad marriages Yeah, is that people don't play their roles. Mm. And so the difference in mm. marriage between success and failure is that. Yeah. <laughs> if you want your marriage to succeed, here's free marriage advice. Husband, play your part. Wife, Play your part. And I promise if you will do it God's way, your marriage will thrive yeah. and your marriage will flourish. Yeah. 
You want to add anything to that before we yeah, go well, on? Yeah, well, I mean, the thing I was going to say, well, we're going to talk about dating, but yeah. just people need to understand that whatever happens in marriage is going to be ultimately an overflow of what you did in your single and dating life. 100%. You know? So if you don't obey God in those two areas, your marriage is not going to go well. You're exactly right. You know? Yep. And so I was just thinking, like, as you were talking, I'm like, if you're not obeying God in the in the time where if you're not respecting women while you're single and while you're dating, yep. you, you expect to do that and, right. and to love and lead your wife? And nah, that's, right. that's there's no way. Yep. Obedience just doesn't happen like that in a snap of a right. of a finger, you know? You have to work at that when you're single, you know? That's right. You have to do that in your dating relationship. And then when you're married, it's so much easier. That's right. You know, and, and marriage is one of the hardest things you're ever gonna do. Yep. But if you want it to go well, then follow God. That's but right. it starts today. If yep. you oh, single guys, like, hey, follow God right now. That's exactly you know, right. Single women, do the same thing, yep. and it gets easier. Marriage will be, it's always going to be, I think it's always going to be hard work. I'm not going to say that it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard work, mm -hmm. you know, because love is a commitment. It's not just right. a feeling. Yep, yep, yep. Right. So, but well, that, and to your point within marriage, and I, since you're already going dating, I think we yeah. should go okay, there and just go. talk about yeah, it. Yeah. But, but within marriage, what you said is so important. It is not the love that maintains the covenant. It is the covenant that maintains the love. Mm, okay? That's good. And so I don't stay married because of a feeling. Mm. I stay married because I made a commitment to a person and to God. Mm -hmm. That's the covenant of marriage. And so every day I have to make choices and I have to perform certain actions. This is love. Love is a verb. It's more than a feeling that I have to make choices and take certain actions to maintain the covenant. Mm -hmm. If I'm relying on a feeling to maintain the covenant, I'm in trouble. Because to your point, marriage is hard and every day is not a great day. And I mean, my goodness, the enemy is always trying to tear mm -hmm. marriages down because oh, it's, a, yeah. it's a picture of the gospel. First institution, guys. So, so, I tell young couples all the time that I counsel before marriage, the moment you say I do, your relationship gets harder mm. because your marriage serves a gospel purpose. When husbands do their part and wives do their part, it is a relationship that tells the story of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Like it shows how God loves his people and how his people are meant to love him. And so the enemy knows if he can tear down that relationship, he tears down a relationship that has the power to point people back to Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, my gosh, it's like in marriage, we're dealing with our own brokenness, our own flesh. We got the enemy coming after us. We got the world coming after us. It's hard. Mm -hmm. And so what we can't do is rely on a feeling to maintain that. Yeah. What we do is we go, no, I made a commitment. Mm. And, and this is why we take vows. The way I always say it in a wedding ceremony, we are neither inherently faithful nor honest, so we must stand before God and witnesses and take vows like these. Mm. If we were honest and faithful, vows wouldn't be necessary. But because we're not, we, this is what we do. We stand up and go, I commit. Yeah. For better or for worse, in sickness and in death, for rich or poor, I'm committing my life to you. And then each, each and every day, because we've made that commitment, we take actions and we yeah. make choices to love the person regardless of how things might be, okay? Yeah. But dating, I had a conversation with my 12-year-old the other day. 12-year-old. <laughs> about dating, yeah. Gosh, man, it's... Man. She, she turns 13 this summer. All right, and, let me take uh, notes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we, we were talking about boyfriends, and, you know, my yeah. whole deal was like, do you even know why you would have a boyfriend at 12 or 13? Like, to, do you know the purpose of dating was my question, you know? Mm -hmm. And she said no. And I said, all right, well, let's talk about that. And we're driving in my truck, and I was like, the reason that you date is to find someone to marry. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the whole purpose of dating. You don't just date to date. You don't just like mess around with boys, you know, whatever. Mm. The whole reason that you date is to find someone to marry. And yeah. she's like, oh, I didn't know that. So then I asked a follow-up. Do you think you're ready to get married at 12 years old? <laughs> and she said, no. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, then there's no reason for you to date a boy right now yeah. or to have a boyfriend right now. And I'm not trying to be a jerk about that, but I need my daughter to understand mm -hmm. the purpose of dating and God's plan for dating. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you said is so valuable, man. It's like, the way that you date, in some way, that's going to transfer over into your marriage. Yeah. And so you got to get it right right now. What I always tell single people is that is that in your single years, don't focus on finding the right person. Focus mm -hmm. on becoming the right person. Mm -hmm. Because if you spend all of your time just trying to find the right person, 
Well, you're just going to go through person after person after person after person mm. trying to figure out, is that the right person? And it's a waste of time. But if you will focus on becoming the right person, mm -hmm. I just want to grow into a godly man. I want to grow into a godly woman. I believe what happens is this in dating is that, man, you're running hard after the Lord. And then all of a sudden, as you're running hard after him, at some point you look over and there's some single guy or single gal who's running next to you. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, that might be the right person. <laughs> hey, how you doing? <laughs> they're, they're on the same track. They're chasing the same things. They yeah. care about the Lord like I care about the Lord. And you're like, hey, uh, maybe we should go grab dinner later, you know? And, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and that's the best way, in my opinion, to go about it is that you focus on becoming who mm -hmm. God wants you to be, mm -hmm. and then you trust God to bring a right person into your life all in due time. Yeah. What you don't do is just like chew people up, spit about, and go through person after person yeah. after person. You try and see if it'll uh, work. It, right. I, I'll even say this because, again, we are in a society that loves cohabitation and, and celebrates the idea of sleeping with as many people as you can before you're married, and there's all this talk about body count these days, and it's so stupid. Yeah. It's stupid. Here's what I want to say, man. If that's what you're doing in your dating relationship, you are practicing for adultery in marriage. Oh, yeah. If in your dating life right now, you're shacking up and sleeping around and going through person after person after person, you are practicing for adultery in marriage. Do you really think that at some point someone's going to come along and you're going to say, I do, and you know, here you are sleeping around now and all of a sudden it's just going to come to a screeching halt? Once you're in a marriage relationship, no, I think you're still going to be tempted to do what you were doing in your dating relationship, mm -hmm. which is to be sexually active and not faithful. And so I'm, I'm saying this out of love, man. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. The greatest thing that you can do, single people, in your dating relationships is to be faithful to God and to be sexually pure and to do it his way and to become the right person and to trust God to bring someone into your life who's on the same track as you as it concerns following Jesus. Mm. I just care about our young adults, man. I know you do too. Yeah, no. And I, and I believe that age Oof. group is being fed so many lies oh, these yeah. days. Oh, so many lies. And I don't know. I just, I want to be the guy raising a flag going, don't believe the lies. Yeah. There is a better way. There's a better way. If you will do it God's way, that's the difference between success and failure in your dating. Yeah, no, I love that, man. I love, and you got to, like, I, I heard a pastor say this once. He was, he said, be the person you're looking for is looking for. So mm. if you want to, you, you want a godly person, be a godly person. Right. And I heard another pastor say, uh, ladies, start running after Jesus. Yeah. Because then the guys at least will be in the right direction. Exactly right. right. <laughs> and so he was just talking about all this stuff. Like, hey, if men and women in that are young adults, you got to run after Jesus in such a way that makes a difference in your life because it will impact everything yeah. else. And yeah, the yeah. thing about dating, dating is a process you go through, not something you sit in. Mm. It's so it's not something that, hey, we're just going to date to date. No, yeah. you're dating for a purpose. You're That's dating right. with a, a mission. Like, hey, I want to get married. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. this is why I'm dating. Yeah. And, and also, men, you got to let the girl know yeah. that this is why you're dating. Like, I can see this as a potential. And if it's not a potential, get out of it. That's exactly you know? right. Guard yeah. her heart. And ladies, yeah. same thing. Right. But when you, when you do it the right way, you're not wasting time. Mm -hmm. I see so many young adults today, they waste time. Mm-hmm. Because they don't know what they want. That's right. And then they also, they're not running after Jesus. They're running after pleasure. Yep. And at the moment, that's what they're getting. And so they're staying longer than they need to. Right, right, right. But our dating relationship shouldn't bring us these pleasures that we're looking for. Right. Marriage should bring those that's right. That's right. things. Yep. And so, yeah. I'll, I'll say this, man, and we can wrap this thing up. Um, instead of talking about a bunch of other categories, I would just say apply the same logic to other categories. Mm -hmm and read the word of God and see what God says about money, about parenting, about all of these other categories that we often talk about, and just do it God's way. That's the difference between success and failure. But you know what I was going to say about dating really quickly before we end, I, I think another difference maker is seeing the person in that dating relationship, and, and even within marriage for that matter, as a son of God or as a daughter of God, mm -hmm. okay? When I remember that my wife is a daughter of God and that she belongs to him before she belongs to me, mm. and that I'm going to stand before him one day and answer for the way that I loved his daughter, that, uh, that, that motivates me to love her well. Yeah. 
And so I would say, if you can learn to think like that within your marriage or your dating and relationship, that's a son of God, that's a daughter of God, right? Like I don't get to use that person or take advantage of that person or abuse the person or whatever. That person belongs to God before they belong to me. Mm. And they deserve to be treated with kindness and dignity and respect. And ultimately I'm gonna answer to God one day for whether or not I did my part in this relationship. I just think that provides a little extra motivation to make sure you're doing it in a way that honors God. Yeah. No, that's so good, man. I, it sounds like we might need to do a, a dating podcast. I mean, that, that might need to <laughs> be one of the topics. Hang on you, know? for, yeah. you got a young adults podcast. We can we can yeah. do it on there, bro. Yeah, that that will sound good. But man, that was so good. Um, and that's just a good place to to put, it, man. I, I honestly just just follow God. Yeah. In all those areas, and, right. and you will be successful. That's right. I love that. Well, that's a good place to pin it, man. Thanks for listening. And as you go, we just want you to know that we we love you. We're here for you, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Pursuit with James Griffin. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll never miss an episode. If you have questions about the message, the scriptures, or faith in general, you can send them to us by texting the word QUESTION to the number 22722. For more information about our church or this podcast, please visit crosspointcity.com or follow us online at Crosspoint City. If you found value in this podcast, we would love it if you took time to like it and share it with a friend. Doing that will help more people know and follow Jesus. And finally, we want to invite you to join us each week for one of our gatherings in person or live on YouTube. We hope to see you soon.